Welcome to Story Machine Games. My name is Jacob Meyer, and today I'm going to teach you how to play Rosetta the Lost Language, a cooperative language puzzle game for two or more players. In Rosetta the Lost Language, you'll work as a team to translate an inscription from an ancient language before its meaning gets lost to history. One player acts as the author of the ancient language, while the remaining players are experts, linguists and archaeologists who stumble upon this mysterious inscription while working in an intriguing location. Over a series of turns, the experts make guesses as to what they think the inscription might mean, and the author translates those guesses by drawing new symbols in the same language as the inscription. Using creativity, deduction, and the help of a few special abilities, you'll have 10 turns to correctly guess the meaning of the inscription and save the language from being forgotten. Get it wrong, and the language will be lost forever. Rosetta the Lost Language comes with 20 inscription cards, 10 location cards, five double-sided ability cards, 10 dry erase guess cards, two dry erase markers, and one rule book. It all comes in this nifty magnetic lidded box. Before starting the game, choose one player to act as the author. Ideally, this will be someone who's played the game before and who knows how translation works. The author will choose one random location card and one random inscription card and place them side by side, face up in the play area. The author then chooses two random ability cards from the ability deck and places them side by side near the inscription and location cards. Now keep in mind the ability cards are double-sided, so if you choose one that you've already played before, you can just go ahead and flip it right over to get a new one. The author then either hands out the guest cards numbered from one to nine or lays them out on the play area. Once the cards are laid out, it is time for the author to choose a meaning, a word or two that the inscription represents as inspired by the location and the unique attributes on the inscription card. Now, since this is a cooperative game, the author only wins if the experts can correctly guess the meaning. So the author should choose something that they think the experts can guess easily based on this location and this inscription. However, there are a few restrictions. First, the meaning cannot be something that is visible in the location card itself. That means for this location, the meaning could not be something like spear or snow or cabin, since you can see all of those things in the location card. Second, the meaning needs to be something that is inspired by the location card. For this location, it could be an abstract concept such as winter or a job like hunter, but choosing something as the meaning like toaster strudel, flat screen TV or space travel doesn't make any sense, so don't choose it. Third, the inscription must be treated as symbolic rather than alphabetical. The components that make up the inscription should not be treated as letters, but as symbols, open to interpretation by the author and the experts as the game commences. You're not trying to spell a word, you're trying to translate the inscription's symbolic meaning. Now, when choosing the meaning, the author also gets to choose the final orientation of the inscription card. Veteran authors will think of inscriptions as made up of smaller components with separate meanings that, depending on the card's orientation, might make them associate definitions in different ways. This will give authors multiple strategies for choosing a meaning that they think the experts will be able to guess. In this example, the author chooses to orient the inscription card like this. They think of this larger part of the inscription as a person of some sort, and these two smaller parts as perhaps tools. Looking at this location, the author sees trees and log cabins, and they think someone must have had to chop down these trees to build these log cabins. A lumberjack. Now there is no lumberjack on the card, so they decide to make lumberjack the meaning of the inscription. They write lumberjack on the back of the meaning card, making sure that none of the experts see what they're writing, and place the meaning card meaning side up in the play area to begin the game. Gameplay for Rosetta of the Lost Language is a back and forth between the experts guessing what they think the meaning of the inscription is and the author translating those guesses back into the same symbolic language as the inscription, either by drawing the symbols that already exist on the inscription card or inventing new symbols entirely. The experts start by flipping over the first guess card and writing their answer on the back. 
So how do the experts choose what to guess? Well, you could guess anything, but remember, the author chose something as the meaning that they think would be easy for the experts to guess based on this location and this inscription. The experts' guesses are chances for the author to give them clues as to what the meaning of the inscription might be. The meaning itself can't be something that you can see on the location card, but guessing things you can see can give the author the chance to define a part of the inscription. For example, when the experts see this location, they see trees, log cabins, and a forest in the background, so they think tree. While they know that the meaning can't be tree itself because there are trees visible in the location card, they strategically think that learning the translation of the word tree might help push them in the direction of learning the entire inscription itself. They write tree on the back of the first guest card and hand it to the author to translate. Translating is how the author communicates with the experts. The author translates the expert's guesses by drawing symbols that that guess represents in the language of the inscription. Translating takes practice and creativity. Sometimes this is as simple as just drawing one of the symbols that already appears on the inscription card, or mixing and matching a couple of those symbols in interesting ways. Sometimes it requires the author to invent entirely new symbols in the language of the inscription to help the experts in their quest to guess the meaning. Since this is a lost language, the author is not allowed to use common symbols such as arrows or stick figures in their translations. They also cannot use letters or other known writing forms and cannot draw pictures that visually represent something like a tree or an ax or a bunny or a horse. Essentially, the author invents a totally new and entirely unique language every single time you play. Back to our example. The experts guess the word tree and now the author has to translate the word tree from English into the same symbolic language as the inscription. Looking at the inscription, the author sees this part, which they initially thought of as some kind of tool, and decides maybe it means the word wood. Since wood is what makes up a tree, the author draws this symbol twice, once on top of itself, and adds two lines on either side like a tree trunk to represent that this is all part of one bounded whole, a tree. Once the author is done translating, they put the guess card back into the play area and the experts continue their guessing with this helpful new clue from the author. Sometimes the experts will guess something that is too far from the meaning to be helpful. When this happens, the author can draw a line through the guess to represent that that guess was irrelevant to helping the experts decipher the meaning. After seeing that their second guess, flower, wasn't helpful for them, the experts decide to double down on the idea of trees. For their third guess, they write forest on the back of the third guess card and hand it to the author to translate. This one's easy for the author to translate. A forest is made up of many trees, so the author simply draws the tree symbol multiple times, and they return it to the play area. Now, before their fourth guess, the experts get to use an ability. That means they get to choose one of the two available ability cards here to use. Abilities give the author the opportunity to give the experts a little more information. In this example, the experts choose to use the dialect ability, which lets the author say an adjective related to the meaning. The author, thinking about lumberjacks, says the word sweaty, hoping that this will make the experts think of a big, sweaty lumberjack. Now, you only get to use one of the two available ability cards per game, so choose wisely. After using their ability, the experts continue to guess, and the author continues to translate. Guess, translate. Guess, translate. Guess, translate. If after their sixth guess, the experts still haven't guessed the meaning, they get to learn the fragment. The fragment appears in the corner of the inscription card. By this point in the game, the author may have already defined the fragment in an earlier translation. If not, this is an opportunity for the author to provide some extra information to help the experts in their final few guesses. Returning to our example, the author gets to tell the experts that the fragment seen here means wood, which the experts can see makes up part of the definition of tree and forest. At this point, the experts think they've figured it out. They've learned from their sixth guess that this in the inscription means person, and they've also learned from the fragment that this means wood.
They're pretty sure that this section of the inscription is a tool of some sort, since it also appears in Hunter, as does Person. What kind of person uses a tool for wood? They decide to go with Lumberjack. They write Lumberjack on the back of the seventh guest card and hand it to the author. The author, to show that the experts have correctly guessed the meaning, flips over the meaning card. Congratulations, you've won. Now, let's say the experts hadn't guessed Lumberjack. After nine incorrect guesses, the experts get to give their 10th and final guess out loud. If by this 10th turn, they've correctly guessed the meaning, Lumberjack, or a synonym of the meaning, something like wood chopper or big buff burly guy like Jacob, everybody wins. If by the 10th turn, the experts haven't guessed the meaning, everybody loses, and the language is forgotten forever. Once the game ends, the author is encouraged to explain the choices that they made while choosing the meaning and translating the guesses. This will help all the players get better and learn new and interesting ways to approach the creative task of building a language from virtually nothing. Different authors will approach choosing the meaning and translating the guesses in entirely different ways. Coupled with the ability to change the orientation of the inscription card, this gives the game endlessly fun and creative replay value. Rosetta the Lost Language plays well with two players, families, larger board game groups, and classrooms, and even over video chat. Check out the game's page on our website at storymachinegames.com and on BoardGameGeek. And please, share your completed languages with us by using the hashtag Rosetta the Lost Language. Thank you so much for watching. And please leave any questions, comments, or jokes about language, archaeology, or lumberjacks in the comments below.